This is Tessa Jeffers with PremierGuitar.com. I'm here with Chris Allen, guitarist for Neon Trees. We're at Riot Fest in Chicago. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, so we're here to talk about some your gear, your rig. And you're um, holding one of your favorite guitars. Tell me a little bit about it. This is my Eric Johnson in Tropical Turquoise. Um, I've had this for a couple years now. Um, I was playing an old Korean Strat. It was my first guitar that I ever got, like, 18 years ago or something but I just got this and uh, I love it it's got so many cool features on it uh, Eric say so you just got it I got it like two years ago so I mean compared to my 18 year old guitar then yeah I think it's pretty it feels like it's pretty new but it's got like uh, quarter saw neck so all the grains go in this way so it's not gonna bow as much over time um, it's got binding on the neck which uh, most strats don't uh, also, one cool thing about it is uh, usually they have a string tree right here to hold the strings down um, against the nut here, but uh, with the Eric Johnson model, it's got a recessed head, and then also these poles get shorter and shorter so that the strings pull down like this. It's supposed to help with sustain, I don't know. So do you think good. it does? I, you like it? Sounds good to me, so yeah, I've been really happy with it. Do you have anything else uh, modded on it, or is it pretty much spec? Well, I, I have modded some other things. Uh, on uh, Everybody Talks, there's an acoustic part that I actually I recorded it with a, like a 1946 silver tone, like really cheap arch top guitar. Um, but there was like this little acoustic sound, and it's kind of really key to the song. So I had to figure out a way to reproduce like an acoustic sound without being able to play an acoustic on stage. Is this the ghost pickup that this I've heard is, about? Okay. Yeah, this is, uh, What's Graftech. the concept with that? Graftech makes this, and it's uh, the acousti acoustophonic uh, ghost system. And so it's got a uh, pickup right here in the bridge. And um, so now I have a, a stereo jack here. So it's sending this signal from my pickup, and then a signal also from the piezo here. and. Um, and this has a really nice acoustic sound to it. Yeah. That's unique. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. I The first time I ever saw that was uh, the Cranberries. Like, I saw them a long time ago, and they were, they had, they were playing a song, and it had this really nice acoustic sound. I'm like, where's the acoustic up there? I think someone was playing, like, a Parker Fly or something. But then, yeah, I figured out what it was. It was uh, they have a piezo pickup in the bridge. See, I really like this one. And then... Um, I also like the the stock pickup that comes in this, the Eric Johnson, but with uh, some of the venues that we play, um, we get a lot of um, interference with the lighting and stuff, so it'll create this really buzzy sound. And I mean, single coils are known for that, but uh, so I, I changed out the pickup here. It's a Lindy Fralin spit, split rail, and uh, it really cuts out the noise and sounds good. So um, we were talking earlier, and you said that you used to be a Gibson you played Les Pauls before, and what made you change? I did. Um, I played I played Gibsons for a number of years, and actually on our last album, Habits, I recorded most of the album with Gibsons. But um, like a week after we finished in the studio, I brought I decided to bring my old Strat in just to, to try it out because I was I was you know like experimenting with some different amps and and different pedals and it's like okay I had to find out the perfect combination to play live and my strat just sounded really good live so so uh, do you change up from when like you're recording the album you'll use different guitars than when playing live oh yeah we'll 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 try out you know we'll, we'll use 15 different guitars in the studio um 12 different amps, just a ton of different pedals. Some of them, you know, I'm borrowing from other people, some I'm renting, or I'm just using my own stuff. But, uh, yeah, we try not to limit ourselves in the studio trying to figure out, like, oh, are we going to be able to play this live exactly the same? We just want to get the, the best, you know, product we can um, and the best sound we can on the album. And then later... Plus you're in the moment. Yeah, and then later just try to figure out how to reproduce it. You know, you don't want to stifle the creativity because you know you can only use the one guitar live so uh, is this your number one guitar or is this your number one guitar you know it's like asking me to choose between children um but i would say this is like 1.5 but i'd say i'd have to say that eric johnson is my number one and that was because uh well because of the um the acoustophonic 
uh, piezo pickup in it, I'm able to do the acoustic. It has just a little bit more um, versatility, I think, to it. And so I end up having to play this one on certain songs where I can't really play this one. You said that I was uh, you play um, that one on the Everybody Talks Everybody because talks. of the acoustic part. Yeah. Okay. And Which uh, songs do you play this guitar on? Um, every night it's kind of been changing since I only got this like three months ago um, I've just been figuring out which songs it sounds better on and um, yeah I really like this one on Teenage Sounds um, I like it on I, I actually really like it on every song but I'd say with the other one Everybody Talks uh, Lessons in Love because it's got a little more grit to it um, with Derek Johnson um, and everything else is kind of 50-50 I, just depending on the night I'll switch up right. but I did s you have a, a few other guitars um, with you tell me a little bit about those and I think you said you played one of them just on one song yeah my black jazz master uh, it's a Mexican jazz master and I, I have it in a different tuning it's a completely different tuning and uh, right now in our set there's only one song that we played on and it's Sins of My Youth um, before, on you know the last album cycle, we were playing uh, farther down, and we have a, a few other like really older songs that I used that tuning a lot, like almost exclusively. I played that more than I did standard tuning. But so your black jazz master has a crazy pit guard. It's like neon trees screaming. Tell me about it. You got it? Where'd you get it? I ordered the pit guard on eBay. I, I it had tinsel. Uh, like inside the pit guard and so when the lights hit it just right um, it kind of looks like there's LEDs in there and it just kind of sparkles it's cool so this guy though um, I had this custom made and um, what's cool about this and what's sentimental about this one is I, I used to play with this bassist back in high school and um, he used to, he worked for Fender at the time uh, that was like I don't know like 14 years ago or something and uh, I decided to look him up see if he was still working there and he's actually a master builder there now oh, awesome. and so I hit up our rep at Fender and I said hey you know could I have him build me something and um, so I heard I heard from him on Facebook a little bit after that and he said I, I'd love to build something for you so this one I had been thinking up for like a year and a half um, just like every single feature on it I, I wanted to have on a guitar and some of the things I took from the Eric Johnson like the quarter son neck I wanted it to have the same feel the same profile to it um, and then it's got a like the Fender 12 string headstock on it but with only the six strings on it so that kind of looks cool and I feel like the design down here kind of really goes well with the Jazzmaster body it's got a 63 new original stock Telecaster bridge pickup, jazz master, neck pickup, and this is all test Telecaster hardware, and then I designed the shape of this uh, pick, it's just a single ply uh, pick guard. What, why did you design it like that? It looks smaller? Yeah, I just liked it simple, I just wanted it simple. Um, I, de I definitely wanted it to have a pick guard, but I didn't want it to be like all over the place, and I figured like the more wood, the better. I didn't want it covering up too much, and I know it doesn't really affect the resonance a whole lot, having a bigger pickguard, but I just wanted it real simple, so I just did the one ply and real tiny, and I just kind of like this shape. Me and my guitar tech are always thinking about uh, That's Josiah? What the next, yeah, Josiah, what the next guitar is going to be like. I have one where I want it to be like all avocado green, like a matte finish, but every single thing, like all the fretboard, the headstock, all the hardware. We can talk about your pedal board. Uh, yeah, we can talk about it. I saw it was labeled a lot for uh, specific songs. Yeah. What's that all about? Yeah, well, I just got a um, Cusack pedal tamer, um, and that switches helps me switch between all my different effects. It was getting a, a little bit too tough, you know. I was doing a little too much tap dancing, you know. Uh, with you know, I was able to I was able to manage it with just the one album of material. But now that we have two albums, it's, it was getting a little hectic. And so, with that, I can hit one button and it'll switch you know five or six different pedals on or off. And so that's been really helpful. Um, there are a lot of unique uh, tone sounds on that album. Is it hard to get them live? 
Uh, it was at first, but now I've got it d pretty much dialed in to where I'm getting all the sounds that I want. Uh, Is there any pedal that you can't live without? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, one yeah. that I have on almost all the time is my Ibanez Tube Screamer. And I used to have the TS-808 reissue, um, and I really liked that, but I was I was going through them a lot. I was breaking them for some reason. I think it was TSA, you know, flying around so much. And uh, I kind of had a... My pedal board wasn't so great, and I didn't pack it the right way. Anyway, this time around, I bought one of the hand-wired ones that they that they just redid. They hand-selected the chips, and they hand-wired the pedal. It's like a different color. It's a dark green. Um, it just... I, I A-B'd the two against each other, and this one just sounded way better. And that's like my, my main pedal. Um, another one that I just started using on this album was is my uh, Digitech Hardwire chorus pedal and it's just like a hundred dollar pedal but it has a really good chorus sound to it and that I, we put it all over this album so i was uh kind of running out of space on my pedal board i already have like one of the biggest ones that they make uh, that, that pedal train makes and so i had very little space to work with and so i started looking for smaller pedals and uh, i came across maleco and they make these little mini ones um, so those are Maleco's? yeah they're just tiny and uh, I really like the sound of them. And they're also really affordable, like 100. Well, I think we paid 100 for one of them. Uh, I don't remember if it was the tremolo or the vibrato. And then 140 for the other one. And for like boutique type pedals, like that's, you know, that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, really like, like them. Uh, you have a Zvex. What, what kind of pedal is it? It's the, it's F, I the Fuzz it. Factory. Well, Zvex is a really fun company. I like all their hand painted stuff. I didn't. I didn't spring for the hand painted pedal, uh, the hand painted pedal, but uh, it looks hand painted, kinda. Yeah, it's got I mean, like the rainbow. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but the the hand painted ones, I guess it's like the whole thing is done. It's like a unique piece of art, and this one just kind of has the name on it, like painted on there. So, but uh, yeah, it's a fuzz pedal. It's kind of a, a vintage style. Real, it's real crazy, like nasty sounding fuzz. It's it squeals. Is that how you like your fuzz? Sometimes, you know. Do you use it very much? Um, I use it on two songs. So Which ones? Not a ton. I use it on Teenage Sounds and uh, on the end of Trust. So what about your amp setup? Um, I'm playing through uh, Laney Lionheart 20 watt hand wired amp. I've, it's the, I think it's just the LH20 is, is the name of it. Do you switch up amps a lot or do you pretty much go with what you like? And you know what you like? Yeah, I've been playing Laney for a couple years now. Before that, I was playing uh, Fender, Hot Rod Deluxe, and uh, before that, I was playing a PV, like a really old uh, PV amp. But uh, yeah, in the last two years, I've found that the that the Lionheart series are really good. Just hand wired, even though it's only 20 watts, it gets really loud, and uh, it just it sits right in the mix. It's your wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah. This is Tessa Jeffers for Premier Guitar, and I'm here with Brendan Campbell of the Neon Trees, bassist, lead bassist. Yes. <laughs> lead bassist, indeed. And we are at Riot Fest in Chicago at the Congress Theater. How are you doing? Awesome. Thanks for coming out. Your hair looks great. Oh, thanks. You know, I combed it just for you guys. I was wearing a hat all day, and I thought, you know, Tessa is coming, and premier guitar that you know I wanted to look nice for you thank you you did a great job yeah, so what are you holding there this here is a 1961 uh, Fender precision precision <laughs> uh, P-Bass we'll just say yeah P-Bass this is my hands down favorite bass so this P-Bass is your favorite you said 61 this is a 1961 is this a Frankenstein no oh no, so why is it your favorite bass well, anyone that's played a uh, 1961 Fender, uh, I mean, there's just some mojo to it. I think really, I mean, it's to me, it's uh, the neck is so comfortable on this. It's nice and worn in uh, on the back. It's uh, it's a flatter uh, shape, you know, on there, so um, it's comfortable for my hands. But I I did actually, uh, you know, add a couple things to it. Uh, when I found it, it actually had already had uh, reissue pickups in it, and the pickguard is replaced. 
So, but I like the idea that it could be a player's base. You know, I didn't want something that I'm just going to put under my bed and, and or not feel comfortable with taking out on, on tour. Uh, I love these. This is called the Babix um, Full Contact Bridge. And it really, like when I first got the base, you know, obviously it played well, but there were maybe a couple, uh, um, not even dead spots, but maybe some spots that jumped out a little bit more, you know, here and there. And when I put this on there, I, it was just night and day. Because uh, part of it too is I, I hit pretty hard with my right hand, and so it really helps almost the way a limiter or a compressor would without affecting the tone. And then the pickups that I put in here are actually made here in Chicago. Uh, they're called Hanson, uh, and these are the Neo Punch uh, P bass pickups. What they do is they uh, they w wire a more like a classic uh, you know Fender style pickup, but then in the back. They put another neodymium uh, magnet in the back, uh, which gives it just almost a little bit more uh, hair on the note and breaks it up a little bit. So, uh, yeah, but it's got the original, it's got the slab board uh, of rosewood. So is the neck unfinished? On the back. Oh, on the back. It used to be finished. I guess now it is unfinished. Nice and dirty. Is this all natural? Oh yeah, no, none of the yeah. This isn't a relic. This is all like, uh, this is how it was. This uh, I found this at uh, Cowtown Guitars in Las Vegas when I was there on tour. It's a vintage shop there, and the guy that there's a local guy in Vegas. He said that uh, has been the bass player for Lenny Kravitz for years. Uh, that uh, brought this in, and yeah. Did Any you say you handpicked the Hanson pickups? I did. You did? And why did you want to choose those? Because uh, of the way that they break up. It almost sounds, uh, they have a natural compression to them that almost like if you're recording and, you know, usually uh, through the board that they're going to put some sort of compressor on the bass. Um, it sounds like that's already been done to them, but they're hotter than other pickups and uh, so it also puts a little bit of, little bit of dirt, kind of like a natural just a natural growl on there that I was using pedals to do before, you know, something like a Sans Amp bass driver or something like that, that uh, it gets, it, I'm getting that more out of the bass and having to put other things in the signal to do that. Um, but yeah, but everything else on here is original. It's got, um, I use the DR uh, fat beams on there, just a regular like 45, 105 set up but you no know, I love this thing it's well balanced and you know I can dig in and I can rock out with it with the pick or I can you know just kind of play at the fingers as well so do you play th this one the most this is number one this what's is, number this two is numero uno uh, number two that's out with me right now uh, is my 66 guild starfire um, which is all hollow body the red hollow body and what you'll notice uh, on there is that it doesn't have the the regular Hagstrom bisonic pickup because that's what you st normally they would use in those guild in the Starfires back then. But when they couldn't get those in from Sweden, they would the pickup that's in there is typically what you'd see on the old guild um, or I'm sorry Hagstrom solid body guitars. Um, and it, you know, some people call it the Mickey Mouse pickup because it looks so cheap or whatever. But again, it's still just a single coil, and it is the loudest and uh, but clearest uh, pickup of any of my basses. And again, it was just a real uh, a real awesome find uh, that I got last year. So uh, that is. Do you always switch your pickups out for whatever you want? No, like I said, that's stock. Oh, that's stock. That's stock. That's why when people see it, they say, oh, that's not the original Hagstrom Bisonic oh, pickup in there that you see in all the Starfire bases in the 60s. Uh, it's because, yeah, because the factory couldn't get those in. And so they used the other Hagstrom, which you would only see in a solid body base or whatever. So it's stock, but very, you know, I guess unique. And I love the sound. I wouldn't change it flat wounds it's tuned to you know e flat and fun and what songs do you play that on that one well i tuned it to e flat so i can use it exclusively on everybody talks and that's a, and the cool thing with that is that we run 
we doubled the base with a uh, with a synth bass uh, line and on the chorus and what's unique about that bass is that how it it complements it and it has like a real natural top end that complements the synth bass uh, as well and so I'm bringing the dirt and the cut you know of the note and then we're getting that under body uh, with the synth. You use the Rick and Bucker for like songs that you really want the really driving like a lead that's why i call you lead bassist because you have that well it's uh i've used a lot of different ones obviously you know people switch instruments for tones but uh we started exploring with different tunings as well and i use a drop d tuning uh with the rickenbacker and it's not so much even a um you know not for like a heavy metal sound because a lot of people associate you know the drop d with you know that kind of thing uh but it's even for more of like a droning like i'll do like the open which would be the open d string which now is the open c so for some of those songs it's yeah it's like an open c you know kind of thing what why did you pick it what do you like about playing it um i think that it when i i stumbled upon the drop tuning because the action was when i got the bass the action was really high and it has a dual truss rod in it and so I didn't really want to mess with it. I didn't want to ruin it or anything like that. Uh, I can, you know, I figure I'm pretty well to get around like a lot of standard stuff and poke around with my bases, but I just didn't want to, you know, risk breaking the truss rod. And so to compensate for the high, you know, tuning and everything, I would just tune the bass down. Uh, it was with me all last year on tour and I would always play it backstage or whatever. And uh, we were backstage, I think it was our last night on the Duran Duran tour last fall, and uh, Tyler said, hey, I have this idea for this song, which became Trust, and he said, here, play this, and it was in that tuning. Cool. And, yeah, so, and the Rickenbacker, when we recorded, it just had that, I think I knew I wanted to use that because it was already in the tuning, and it just ended up having that sound. Again, it's a good complement between, like, the has the really low lows, but it has a cutting top end as well to it. You also have a Hofner. You said you play it um, when you you do like acoustic gigs. What did? Why did you choose that bass? It chose me. Oh really? Yeah. Where? Uh, just one night at a truck stop. You know when you go in there and you look at those dream catchers and those sweatshirts that have owls and wolves on them. Uh, there it was, glowing, like SpongeBob's magic spatula yikes uh no the, i mean hoffner hoffner's and rickenbacker's you know i guess it takes us back to paul mccartney really um uh, you know it's a real uh classic sound that i i i'm instantly drawn to you know a lot of classic and vintage gear uh even if it's not an actual vintage piece if it's more retro that you know i'm down with that as well and but yeah it just it tends to you know lend itself to you know acoustic settings and stuff like that so you know it's really pretty what's the, the actual model name that is the club base limited edition and it's limited because it has the cavern spacing which means the rear pickup is up in the middle instead of back by the bridge and then it also has a limited uh, dark violin finish on there which is uh, it's classy yeah it's classy and, and i love you know props to hoffner for sending it out with the pyramid flat wounds on it. Uh -oh. When we were in the uh, the alley looking at uh, pedal boards and guitars, that uh, something wow. came up. It's like you Ooh. know, this is a uh, that's a beast. Seventy four uh, Gibson Ripper, uh, refinished, uh, as you can tell. But they they put a nice uh, tint to the lacquer to give it a yellowed. Uh, finish to it. Someone just brought you that. Yeah. And for a gift? Uh, no, for a tr I guess I'd like to trade. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll try it out and trade. Uh, trade base. Like a friend? Yeah. And, you know, we all know each other. We're out there on that, you know, that base junkie circuit. Um, it's a cult. Uh, these pickups are also made by Hanson uh, in Chicago. And. Um, yeah, and uh, Hanson is a division of, of Lakeland. Uh, they make all of the uh, the pickups uh, that are in the Lakeland guitars and Hanson guitars. 
and stuff. But this one's great because it's so light, um, you know, especially for, you know, being a, a neck through. It doesn't look light, so that's interesting. It doesn't look light, but people that know, you know, Gibson bases, they're always super heavy. And this one, you know, is just... Like right away, I, I felt how light it was, and then just felt how good it played all the way up the neck, and I was like, "Dude, it's that's it, it's it's happening." Um, so yeah, so this uh, this will keep me warm until I can get back to the White Falcon. The White Falcon's in the nest. There is one more base that you showed me. You said it was a gift from another player. Oh, that's right. Uh, that is the uh, the Black Fender uh, Mike Dirnt Precision P base. Uh, which I believe they designed after uh, a mix between like a 51 and 55 style fenders. Uh, and that one has a 59 custom shop pickup in it, uh, which is all stock. Yeah, Fender, um, I had another one of his bases uh, that Fender uh, sent to me early on, which is now hanging at the uh, Hard Rock Hotel in Hollywood, Florida. They actually did a little thing there for us. Fender sent me a Mike Dirt bass, and they said, "Hey, uh, Mike, you know Brandon is in Neon Trees. He's this, you know, new bass player or whatever, uh, out on the scene, and just let you know, like, he's digging the bass or whatever." It was a Sunburst one, and so uh, we play in Oakland sometime after that, and he comes out to the show and says, "Hey, man, uh, you know, good to meet you. Uh, been working on my new record, and thought that you don't have a black." Mike Dirt bass. You have to have a black Mike Dirt bass. And he said, I didn't want to just order one and have it be, you know, some, you know, sometimes they're not awesome. Sometimes they are just off, you know, off the rack. He said, I wanted you to have this one. You know, I was playing it today and it was really cool. Like, you know, just like down home, like cool guy. Um, so, you know, that really meant a lot to me because he's a great, you know, rock and roll bassist. Uh, and, so yeah, and it's it, and it's cool like to play that bass. Like I can see how they spent the time on it, like to get that sound. That if you want, like you could totally dial in that pick, you know, rock and roll, you know, Green Day sound. Um, so yeah, so I mean that one's a cool one. And I when did you when did he give that to you? It was last year, and but I I added the uh, thumb rest so that I can get some more of a, you know, uh, some finger funk, out of it. Finger funk. But finger funk. One of your favorite basses. Is Flea, right? Oh, I love Flea. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so you're kind of an aggressive player then. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, I'd say that, you know, two people that I channel, and this is interesting because, you know, Flea isn't known as a pick player. You know, there's probably just a handful of songs that, uh, you know, that he's only, you know, played pick on, pick bass. But I try to channel like him and, and Hendrix as, you know, as far as, you know, some of the flow that they'll, you know, but, you know, maybe mixed with some John Entwistle in there as well. Um, but, yeah, with just some of the, the pick action. And a lot of that ends up a lot of upstroking with the pick, to, you know, to keep up, I guess, so to speak. So, yeah. Um, do you want to talk about your very special amp setup that you have? Yeah. Uh, so. Isn't it like one of a kind, one and only? I have unless they're holding out on me, you know, they better not have made another one yet. Uh, but no, I'm playing the new uh, Fender Super Baseman uh, 300. Uh, it's got uh, uh, 6550 uh, tubes, power tubes in it. Uh, and yeah, it's like the vintage uh, Basemans, but it has more power now. And it has two channels, has a vintage and then like a modern channel. And on my pedal board, I made a special uh, channel switcher as well um, that actually has a light built into it so I know like which of the channels that I'm using uh, on there and so you don't have to look yeah not that there's anything rare about it. like yeah like I'm the first dude you know to make a channel switcher or anything like that there are a couple of the unique things about my uh, particular rig uh, first of all is the white Tolex uh, that was a, a one-off that they did uh, for me but the other thing is with the new Super Baseman line, they're doing uh, Neo cabs uh, with the super lightweight cabs. And they sent me one, and I just didn't it, – it wasn't working for me in particular. It was great to move around because it's super light. But the sound, uh, 
it was just it, it was aggressive but it didn't have the the low end uh that i wanted it didn't hit me in the chest and so they were very nice to uh actually um make some that had real speakers um in there and yeah so i'm using two so you're happy with that now oh i love it yeah i love it i love the way it looks i love the way it sounds um yeah and i love the dual channel because you know i can get you know, a variety of sounds i i have an ever-changing mood of you know of bass sounds and stuff you know and and tones and so i think it's it's great to have a an amp that has two channels that you know in case my mood changes then i can just switch the channel and change with it what's your go-to effect uh well and you have a, a pretty sizable pedal board for a bassist yeah, you know. Sorry, for a bassist, that sounded bad. Right. No, no, no. It's, I mean, bass players, you know, aren't always, you know, known for, uh, you know, having a variety of, of effects. And some of them, too, may seem like they overlap. But, uh, you know, it's really because I don't want to, you know, each fuzz pedal is different. So one may work for one song where it's, a, you know, maybe I want one that has less top end, you know, for a different song or less scooped out. But my go-to pedal definitely is the Aguilar uh, Tone Hammer. That's the preamp pedal. That's what I use. I mean, I definitely have found um, the perfect combination between that pedal, um, you know, and going back to this this bass, you know, with the uh, uh, with the Neo Punch pickup in it, and then going into that Fender uh, that Fender rig that. That's all I needed. You could even say, hey, listen, tonight, like, we can't use any of your effects. I'm not going to be one of those guys that says, oh, we can't play that song because, you know, I don't have my, you know, my chorus or my delay or, you know, anything like that. That it's definitely, you know, more of the, you know, the afterthought that comes with the bass lines and the, the underlying tone. But, yeah, the tone hammer is it. But all the pedals on the pedal board I use, um, even if it's just, you know, for the, you know, maybe one of them gets used on a bridge or something like that, but I, I don't like cutting corners and saying, oh, it's easier for me to leave that at home because of, you know, whatever. It's like, no, this is our craft. This is like, you know, we get the privilege of... You like to music. experiment, it seems like. Yeah, I like to experiment, and uh, but I'm also trying to get away from that too, you know, where it's kind of, uh, I mean, it's fun, and there is an art of, you know, experimenting with, with tones and sounds, but I think sometimes you have to learn too when to leave well enough alone because you're always going to be searching. We're always playing with different things. But, you know, if something is working, and, I've, and I try to do that, like, before our tour started, like, get you what is really working, what's the right thing, and really try to, you know, to commit to that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. And so it took a lot of months. And what was a, a great gesture by um, my artist rep uh, at Fender when we were messing around with these new Fender amps, he, you know, I told him, I said, listen, um, I'm really, you know, tr for the new songs, I'm getting the stuff, but for the old songs, I can't get the sound. And a day later, he calls me and he says, hey, I went and grabbed a bass, went in our amp room, copped some of your, you know, tunes, my best ability, watching some of your, U you know, found you on YouTube, some gigs and stuff to get that sound. Try these settings on the amp and tell me what you think and there it was you know and so i thought that was really cool you know that uh uh you know for him to to take the time and to you know to help really tone sculpt that stuff so good word rad. definitely um but yeah on the on the pedal board uh we have the uh the tc uh electronics um uh, that's the uh, Supernova. Is that what it's called? I use it like on one side. It's the delay pedal. Um, but I use that on uh, I Am The DJ when we play that. Um, the Zvex Woolly Mammoth on Trust. Uh, the Phaser pedal, which is actually a guitar pedal. But I use that. Uh, we have a song called Hooray for Hollywood. Um, yeah. And the JHS pedals, like the Green T1. I'll use that on Lessons in Love as a built-in compressor. Um, so I'll do, use that on the verse, like keep the verse tight and then turn it off and let the bass, you know, open up more on the chorus, um, that kind of stuff. Um, what about the Pink Panda one? Yeah, that's a custom one. 
that one because they offer custom paint. Um, so I wanted the pink sparkle with the Bakelite uh, knobs uh, on there. The, the left-hand side is like an SVT kind of preamp modeled after the old SVTs, and the right side is a fuzz uh, on there. And then my favorite uh, fuzz pedal is the uh, another custom one they made for me is the white uh, lowrider. Uh, and uh, you say the, custom sorry. made for you, you just work oh, with custom them. Custom paint. Okay. Custom paint. No, it's called the low drive. I'm sorry, it's called the low drive, uh, but it has a low rider car on there. I'm sure the I'm sure the term low rider. Was that looks cool. The low drive pedal uh, is probably the well, like one of the nastiest like. Uh, bass overdrive sounds that I've uh, that I've used. Uh, what was unique is when we made this when we made the record picture show. Uh, we have Justin Meldal Johnson producing, who obviously recently toured with uh, you know his Nine Inch Nails bass player and has recorded and played with everybody. Uh, and uh, who's also known for you you know having a, quite the arsenal of effects. And then the engineer was Billy Bush who uh, has helped engineer all of the garbage records. So when it comes time to do teenage sounds, we're like, okay, we need, uh, we need the, uh, the, uh, the bass distortion because it's, you know, it's the essence of the bass tone on that song. So everyone lines up. It was like this showdown of, okay, everyone bring out all of your fuzz and drive pedals for bass. I think there was even one that Billy had, you know, locked down in a vault or something like that that was handmade for him. Um, but I was pretty stoked that it was the JHS that I brought, um, you know, that actually won the shootout. And I think what makes it cut so well, too, is that we actually sent it through the DI straight to uh, um, a Teletronics uh, LA-2A, um, you know. And, yeah, so it really helped that uh, the, the bass drive shine on there. This is Tessa Jeffers with PremierGuitar.com.